So we're going to be talking about carbon today and uh, how carbon, hydrocarbons, and functional groups are going to contribute to the structure of molecules that are important to living organisms. Here are a couple of key ideas. And again, we're focusing on uh, the structure of carbon and how it allows us to make these large, complex organic molecules and functional groups, which are key to uh, having molecules interact with each other. So you probably know that organic chemistry is a study of compounds that contain carbon. And uh, pretty much anything that you are is carbon-based if we take the water away. So we already know the structure of carbon, and you know that the electron configuration is going to be the thing that's going to cause organisms or our molecules to interact with each other. In this case, uh, carbon has four valence electrons. That means it can form four covalent bonds with other atoms. And this is the biggest thing about carbon that makes it unique is that first they're covalent, and second they can form four. The most common one you're going to see is methane, which we have right uh, here. And methane, again, in the structural formula of all in sticks, base filling, uh, a little bit larger than F methane is ethane. And I have a functional variant of that is ethene, where the carbons are double bound here. So that changes the shape of the molecule, even though the, uh, uh, the number of bonds may be similar. The other common partners with carbon, uh, obviously, are hydrogen you saw in the last one, but we also have uh, oxygen, nitrogen, uh, also bound to it, along with sulfur and phosphorus. And you already know the structures of those from our last session. Now, carbon bonds with other things like carbon dioxide, or oxygen make carbon dioxide, and then urea. We have a little structural formula for that right over here. And urea is common excretion product for uh, protein, uh, breakdown of proteins. We can also have a chain shape because of the way that the carbons are bound to each other. Make these right here are linear, and then these guys down here are branched. We can also have rings. Uh, we can have both single bonded and double bonded, which is going to cause it to get different uh, shapes as well, like we saw in the previous one. So carbon can be in a variety of uh, shapes, and that again allows us to get molecular diversity, which allows us to get uh, uh, diversity of uh, larger molecules and interactions between them. So when we take a carbon and add hydrogen to it, we have a hydrocarbon. These guys have lots and lots of energy. They're really, really incredibly stable. You know, if you think about oil as a hydrocarbon, it is uh, stored underground, um, you know, trapped in the decaying bodies of organisms for millions of years and doesn't decompose. Or uh, a tank of um, propane that you have for your grill, that does really very little um, decay over time. The hydrocarbons are very, very stable. But when they do react, they release a large amount of energy. They are huge releasers of energy. Uh, think about burning uh, propane again, or even burning a potato chip, which has lots of, lots of carbon, uh, hydrocarbons in it. Here's an example of a molecule that contains lots of hydrocarbons. In black is a carbon, single bound right here, and the uh, gray right there, those are the hydrogens. I have a couple of oxygens right here. This is a fat droplet, stained red. Um, they don't normally appear red in you. So functional groups are going to be molecules that are added to these hydrocarbon backbones. The hydrocarbons are stable and non-reactive, but if you add a polar functional group to it, then the molecules may become reactive, and then they interact with other molecules that are also polar. So polar molecules will interact with other polar molecules. The nonpolar hydrocarbons, pretty much it will interact with anything. So there are seven different uh, functional groups that you guys are going to need to know. And uh, all, all but one of them are polar, and uh, they are going to be giving us uh, the properties of these molecules. And then they're also going to be giving us uh, some unique characters that we can remember. So, for example, here, uh, this right over here is estrogen, and this is testosterone, and you can see that these molecules are very similar in their structure. There's only two small differences between them. And yet, if you think about a male and a female, and the fact that females have much more estrogen, males have much more testosterone, uh, then you're going to see that the very small differences can lead to large phenotypic effects, like we see the differences in humans between males and females. So here are the functional groups, hydroxyl, carbonyl, carboxyl, amine, sulfhydrophosphate, and methyl. Now, the first one, hydroxyl, is very simple. It's just an OH that's added. And anytime you have hydroxyl, then you're going to have yourself an alcohol. And ethanol, which is our uh, 
our mascot. I'll show you that picture here in just a second. And that is going to be uh, one of the most commonly known alcohols. But, you know, isopropyl alcohol, any rubbing alcohol, anything that has alcohol in it, it's got hydroxyl only on it. And then what are the properties of hydroxyls? That's what you want to, uh, want to think about, especially in how well they can mix with water. So carbonyls are going to be carbon is double bound to an oxygen. And carbonyls can have two forms, ketones, where it's within the structure, and then the acetone we see here, and then aldehydes, where it is going to be at the end. So a propanal is an example of an aldehyde, and acetone is an example of a ketone. You probably know acetone because it's the nail polish remover that most uh, people use to, to take nail, nail polish. And then there's all kinds of aldehydes out there. We'll certainly run across several of those during the, uh, during the course of this class. And then if you take a carbonyl and a car uh, hydroxyl and you put them together, so there's the carbonyl there, and there's the hydroxyl right there, you get what's called a carboxyl. And this forms acetic acid. And acetic acid is the primary component of vinegar. In fact, vinegar is 3% acetic acid, 97% water. Anything that's got a carboxyl on it's going to be called a carboxylic acid or just an organic acid. Um, acetic acid is one of the examples of that. And we're going to see carboxyls a lot in this course. Aminos are a nitrogen with two or three hydrogens bound to it. This is the uh, amine group. And uh, the amino acids have a carboxyl uh, on one side here. And they have an amine on the other side, which is how they get their name. Uh, amine acid. So they can be, again, they can be uh, non-ionized or they can be ionized. Sulfhydrils are S and H, so they've got a sulfur and hydro hydrogen attached to them. And they are also found in amino acids as the R group in the amino acids. This is going to be the part that's unique about it. Um, Sulfhydrils are highly electronegative, and so they're going to be binding often with each other uh, to form a cross-linked bond. So those of you with really, really curly hair have lots of cysteine pro uh, amino acids in the hair, and those uh, cysteines have these sulfhydrils. The sulfhydrils bond together, and they make the hair curl. Those of you with straight hair do not have very many of those, and that's why they don't have that cross-linking, and that's why you don't have uh, curly hair. Phosphate is a phosphate with a phosphorus with four oxygens, and phosphates, uh, there's lots of those. Uh, ATP is a triphosphate. This is a glycerol phosphate, and these guys are going to be uh, involved in lots of energy reactions, and they also are going to be doing a lot to change the shape of molecules. And so they, uh, uh, they do a lot of stuff. We're going to refer to phosphates repeatedly in this class. Uh, methyl group is uh, super cool. It is a one functional group, which is nonpolar. And methyl, in this case, is, uh, um, can be found in uh, molecules that have attached to DNA. And because they attach to the DNA, they actually are going to be the thing that are going to keep the DNA from being um, activated. So if you put a methyl group onto um, a DNA molecule, uh, then essentially what that does is it affects uh, gene expression. In the case of methyl, it's actually going to turn it off. It's going to make it not um, uh, not be transcribed.